and I'm with the plant medicine path. And today we have a very interesting topic of a doula, debt doula, a matter of fact. And we have Catherine Durkin today, and she'll explain a little bit about what she does, what brought her to this path, and who she is. So, hey, Catherine, how are you today? Hello, thank you so much for having me. No problem, no problem at all. Let's let's listen. Let's talk about uh, what you do, debt doula, or right. a doula in general. Yeah, so I'm an end of life doula. Um, I think that this is um, a job that many people are familiar with or work that many people are familiar with, but they might not be familiar with the title. So for a long time, most families have somebody that they kind of go to, or maybe friends have somebody that they go to when they receive um, a tough diagnosis or uh, a, they're dealing with a terminal illness. And if a doctor says, well, it's time to get your affairs in order, some people have no idea what that means. Right. So they have somebody that they call. I've been that role in my family and my friends for a long time. I was raised Irish Catholic. So I was at my first last rites when I was about five. Mm -hmm. And the Irish have a very you know, distinct relationship with death. You surround the dying person with a lot of love and a lot of stories and a lot of tears and a lot of laughter and some drinks. Um, yep. And you, that carries that person through to transition. We take care of the body afterwards. It's a very normal, healthy aspect. Death is a part of life. So I carried that with me. I'm, I, you know, I'm not Catholic anymore, but I'm always gonna be Irish. So I right. took that with me into other groups. And as I got older, it transitioned to a, a volunteer position with host, two different hospice groups in Tampa, where I'm from. And again, just surrounding the dying person with a lot of love, with some education beforehand so they know what to expect, um, helping to reduce fear and anxiety, helping to reduce suffering, physical suffering, as well as emotional and spiritual suffering. And so when I was looking for a career change during the pandemic, somebody said to me, you're already doing this. It's called doula work. And why don't you go back? And I mean, you know, as we all know, hospice trains you extensively, but she said, go back to school and really consider this as, you know, your calling. And it really was. So I went to the University of Vermont. I got trained as an end of life doula. I joined National End of Life Doula Alliance, which promotes best practices amongst doulas in this country, and um, and started my private practice. And it's been it's just been a wonderful way to help support people during this what I believe is just a sacred time in their life. Right, it is pretty sacred because we talked a little bit before this conversation before we got on, and we talked about our two things that we experience is death, life and death and most of us really really fear death and you know that's i mean coming to the medicine is one thing that i ex actually feel that i experienced death on a dft experience and in my family death has been talked about a lot you know we don't we've so but a lot of people aren't comforted with death so how do you go ahead and comfort people with the death aspect well i think it's important first to kind of a doula does not walk into any situation trying to fix things. We don't, we don't even guide. We listen and we support. That's our job. And so the first thing we need to do is kind of talk about why somebody has anxiety around dying and death. And this can be done before uh, a diagnosis is even uh, happening. So there are lots of reasons why people feel anxiety, right? It could be because as a society, we're not encouraged to talk about it. We're not encouraged mm -hmm. to learn about the dying process. And that mystery, that um, you know, um, kind of taboo around the topic makes it frightening. Right. There's also just you know, lots of people who are very involved in hospice or with the dying are also scared, even though they know all the things that surrounds it. Well, that might be because they witnessed the death of somebody that seemed frightening, that seemed scary. You know, maybe they saw their grandparents suffering and that scares the heck out of them. Right. When we talk about that. Some people are just afraid because it's mysterious, right? Very we don't really know for sure what happens. And so there's an element there that's going to make anybody kind of nervous because we don't know what's going to happen for sure. 
So I think all of that kind of comes into play. And when we talk through our fears, a lot of times that can reduce anxiety, but then there are all other ways. Once I hear from somebody what they want to do with the rest of their life, what their goals are, what their fears are, well, then we can kind of talk after listening to them, we can kind of talk about ways that they can reduce their anxiety if that's what they want to do. We talk about what does a good death look like to you? It's different for everybody. So once they kind of let me know what it is they're looking for, we can talk about different ways to reduce anxiety and not only have a better death, but have a better life living without that constant fear. Um, can so we talk about that for a second? Can we ask that question? What do people, I mean, what is the, what do people look for? What, do, what, what is the answer to that question most of the time? What are people looking for as a good death? Well, gosh, a What's lot of people, a lot of people say that the, a good death means dying at home. Hmm. Um, oftentimes my clients will say that they, uh, a good death means telling somebody they're sorry, telling somebody they love them or telling somebody that they forgive them. So um, it's all things, we, all, basically all the things we should be doing every single day of our lives. Well, there are things we can do right, right. now while we're alive to make it better down the road. People right. are also afraid, uh, or there's a real fear of physical suffering. Mm. So we talk about that. What can the medical team do? Um, you know, suffering at end of life is not something we have to endure. There mm. are plans in place, palliative care physicians, hospice teams that can actually help with regards to that especially if they're brought on board earlier rather than later. So those it's really important for doulas to listen because everybody has a different idea. Some people think a good death just means being comfortable and they don't care where they are. So I can't promise much. The only thing that I can guarantee for my clients is that I'll be with them. Yeah. I'm there to hold space. I'm there to support and I'm there to walk them home. And so I can guarantee that whatever they go through, they will not do it by themselves. And so that's really important. And then if they really do want to work through and, and limit the suffering that they feel emotionally or spiritually, well, we have a toolbox filled with some things that studies have shown, my experience have shown that work in reducing that anxiety. So we give some, some of them a try. Yeah, that's pretty, that is such an interesting topic how, about death and you know you, you talk about only like when somebody is diagnosed with something but how about if somebody wants to feel what death is about before they're diagnosed can we do that yeah, yeah that's a great idea and so um i encourage that so plant medicine is is a really great way to experience ego death sometimes, um, to experience whatever it is we're supposed to experience, right? And part of that can lead to reduced anxiety around death. And so I encourage people to give that a try. If, if, if it seems like the right fit, if it seems like it's calling to you, maybe we should listen to that and explore it a little bit deeper. Um, and that's challenging, right? Because people have fear wrapped up in that. It's fear of the unknown. It might be illegal in some places. I work with the Aspera Psychedelic Society where it's legal in Jamaica. And so right. we get we have retreats where people go and they feel a little bit more comfortable there, right? Because it's legal, it's safe. Um, and then they, can, they know somebody's kind of sitting with them and then they can do a deep dive and explore without that worry or fear. Um, I also work with some just top notch therapists in this country who work with clients underground uh, to provide that kind of medicine for them. And I'm just there simply in the name of harm reduction to be a trip sitter. Trip sitting is similar to doula work in that we're not guides. We're not there to provide any answers. We're there to hold space, to help integrate after the experience and kind of find out how it can reduce anxiety and lead to a better life and death. Um, but it really, it's, it's so encouraging to watch people who really are called to plant medicine in a variety of different ways. And you, you can witness 
um, some miraculous interventions that help allow them to maybe work through some trauma. Maybe it helps them work through some fears and then they can integrate that into their life to uh, benefit from it. Absolutely. You know, can you brush out a little bit of that retreat you have in Jamaica? Can you touch on that a little bit or is yeah, that something? So we have we have retreats um, for people, and again, you don't, it's an end of life retreat yes. because we specifically are talking about end of life issues. Mm -hmm. And you're there with me, a death doula. So we're going to talk about these things and we're going to kind of hopefully work through them over the course of a week. Um, but you don't need a diagnosis to come. You know, a lot of us have fear of death from the time that we realize death is a thing, right? So you don't have to wait until the end to kind of explore this and maybe uh, and maybe work through it. A lot of people, especially younger people, want to have a different relationship with death than their parents. Mm -hmm. And they have to take care of aging parents. So they want to do it in a way that's mindful and um, holistic. And so come on down to Jamaica and join us. We also have training programs for end of life doulas who want to incorporate plant medicine because it can be such a help for people at end of life. So they wanna make it a part of their practice. So they can come down to Jamaica and join us too. I love that, that's awesome. And the underground is starting to get less underground just because of people like you, you know? I mean, these medicines used under the right ramifications with the proper set and settings are probably some of the most powerful medicines for mental health that you'll ever use. Just use properly and with the right intentions. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. So yeah, let's get it out. Let's get out of the, all the cobwebs in the dark corners yeah. and let's talk about it more. Because we have to start somewhere and these are just catalysts. These medicines are just absolute catalysts and they just get you there. But there's actually a process to all these medicines, and that's what we try to do here to inform people. But what you do and what other people do in this space is what we need, this information. And death is very mysterious. And death, we should accept death with a little more dignity, I guess. And it's almost a beautiful thing because that's what, I mean, that's what we're looking forward to, aren't we? I mean... Not looking forward to all so, but you know, that's that's our goal. I mean, we're gonna die, so we should die gracefully. Yeah, I mean, and that looks different for different people. There are some people who uh you know have religious convictions and they they really think that um you know they think they they know what's gonna happen after they die. That can give them comfort. Um, there are other people who kind of embrace the mystery of it. Um I think it's comforting to know that people who have had um, clinical deaths and then were resuscitated and brought back have overwhelmingly positive experiences to talk about. So the vast majority of these people die and feel bliss. They feel comfort. They feel overwhelming amounts of love. Um, and they don't want to come back. And so that must tell you something. Um, it, that it must, it, it must. And you know, I don't know what it is, but is that a DMT release? Is it your brain? Is it, I don't know, but it's something. I mean, yes. it's been documented just so many times with these near death experiences, these same visions, these same things we see, even on these deep psychedelic journeys, it's all the same. Same thing. It's the it's same very list. Similar. Yeah, mm -hmm. the studies show that they're having the same kinds of experiences. And I'll tell you another thing that's kind of comforting. At the end of life, about 80 to 90% of us will experience something called near-death awareness. And this is when a lot of people say, oh, they're talking to the angels. But somebody is having a visit. And they get a visit from somebody. Nine times out of 10, it's a relative or a loved one that's already deceased but they come and they visit the person who's dying and they provide comfort love they let them know they won't be alone now sometimes if you're in the room with a loved one who's dying and they are seeing or talking to somebody that you can't see or hear it can be alarming for the loved one yeah 
So one of the things that we talk about in preparing for the dying process is to allow your loved one to experience this, to be okay with it. And then when they come back and they're lucid and they're back in the room with you, ask them if they can tell you about it. Um, most of the time, these visits provide comfort and they provide um, a lot. The, the person experiencing them feels a lot of love, knowing that they won't be alone, that they'll have loved ones with them, guiding them through this transition. But like a bad trip, sometimes it can be alarming. So I have found that helping people by reminding them what we would before a bad trip is it's very similar. Be open to whatever it is you're supposed to learn. If you see stairs, climb them. If you see a door, open it. If something scares you, don't run. Turn around and face it and say, what are you here to teach me? And so far, that really helps people. Um, like I said, most of the visits are positive. But when they're a little alarming, I have found the same kinds of tips for a good psychedelic experience is similar to the kinds of tips for uh, a good near-death experience as well. I guess what happens at the end of the day is we find beauty in that. And that beauty is something that we find comfort in. Can you say that's the case maybe? Yeah, I think um, a lot of these experiences can help people reduce their anxiety. Um, learning how to meditate is a very uh, successful way to just kind of be here in the now and right. to be mindful. So that's something that if somebody wants to reduce their anxiety and, and experience a more joyful death, you've got these options. You've got you know, actions that we can take saying, I'm sorry, saying, I'm, I love you, saying, I forgive you. We can meditate. We can bring in plant medicine. We can just kind of talk through our fears, get more educated about the dying process, talk about how people have experienced it, who've then come back and told us what, what it's like. Um, all of this combined together can help people reduce their anxiety in such a way that their life is made better because they're not worried constantly about this and their death is experienced with more joy because they're not worried because they know they have somebody there who will support them. They have loved ones, um, even folks whose family isn't nearby. You know, there's no evidence that we die alone. So right. that all that information can be very empowering and also very helpful for people who aren't used to talking about it. Right, right. But you know, another thing, I, this might be an off the wall question, but it's a question I have because I've seen it happen so many times. If you're married for a long time or you have a loved one for a long time and that loved one seems to die, why does the process of the second one that's not dead yet happen so quickly? I see it all the time happen when you're married so long or with somebody so long. The other one that could have no health problems, but as soon as that loved one dies, the other one seems to go right along really quickly afterwards. Is there some kind of theory to that or something? But it happens a lot. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some truth to the idea of dying of a broken heart. I think yeah. that, that that's that been talked about since the beginning of time. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, if we can make ourselves sick, we can, um, that, that eventually is what's going to happen. We if somebody finds that the love of their life is gone, some people really are able to go on. Um, the happiest, the happiest couples, um, somebody passes away and the other one, you know, finds another love, loved one quickly after that. Um, but it can go the other way too. Somebody can just kind of give up and die of heartbreak. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's that loneliness and that loss. And, you know, what a great subject today. What a great conversation. Uh, yeah, I want to I wanna make something clear because sure. so many people kind of come to a doula and they want, they want a lot. They want to yeah. kind of, you know, um, they want to kind of be cured of death anxiety. Uh, I've often said a doula doesn't walk into a room and fix anything. Um, the only thing I can guarantee is that you won't be alone. You won't be, you, you won't go through this journey by yourself. So I can help people with, like I said, I have a toolbox. I have lots of things in there that help people kind of make amends and 
really, I mean, I have simple requests too. Like I want to see my granddaughter get married. We have to put on a wedding in this room next week because I want to see her get married before I die. That's very simple. There are yeah. other things that are a little bit more complicated, but when we work through them, all I can say is that I guarantee you, you won't be alone. And I'm going to provide that non-judgmental support and guide and love through the end. And that's what I can do. That's, that's about all I can do. Uh, the rest is just kind of, you know, encouraging where I can and supporting where I can. Well, I think in the Western world and just our Western world society, we all are looking for this quick fix of something that takes a lot of work. I mean, we're all programs of this program and we have to deprogram that program. And that's all it is. And it's going to take time. It takes a lot of time. And what you do is just, you know, I never really heard about this, even on my plant medicine journey, since I've been on this for a while, I just never heard about a doula. But in the last few months, we've been hearing a lot more about them. And I'm really glad we had you on today because I really think death and life and birth is such an important topic. And that's why we're here. And to yeah, fear these so things, very important. To understand them and not fear them so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I tell my clients all the time, there's a whole lot we cannot control. Um, what happens to us often is beyond our control, right. but we can control how we react to it. We can control how we handle it. And I, I again, part of my work is empowering people, letting them know that they have more agency than they ever realized. So many people, um, you know, at end of life, wait until they're, you know, they're surrounded by family, they're surrounded by friends, and they wait for their friends and family to leave, and then they die. That indicates we have some control. Some, so many clients, so many hospice patients have, you know, I've had family members say, oh, they're hanging on until so-and-so gets here from, from Miami. And I'll just kind of laugh and think, no, that's not possible. They're about to die. But they hold on until that relative gets there from Miami. So even those of us that work in this space all the time, we're, conf we're constantly reminded, you don't know everything. This yeah. is a mystery. And so you just remain open, remain open and curious and um, take every single thing that you encounter as a learning opportunity so that you can apply it next time. Um, and I think that's part of it. Just remain open and curious until the very end. Right. Because it has to be curious because we don't really know, do we? We don't. No. no so, we don't. It's a beautiful subject. It's a beautiful thing. Well, thank you very much today, very much for your conversation. And thank you for your participation in our group. I see that you're always involved with that and with people in the group. And that's really awesome. And if you want to just talk a little bit about more, anything else you want to discuss or, or touch base on any retreats or anything you want to go over before we end? Well, so Diaspora Psychedelic uh, Society in Jamaica is always available for retreats with plant medicine. I'm at Anitya Doula Services and I live in Chicago now, um, but I am just a, a real um, advocate and I can be helpful for people either remotely or also in, in the Chicago area or like I said, I travel as well. We have a question, if you don't mind asking her this question. How can, can you explain about why and how psychedelics keep, how they help people overcome fear of dying? Right. So I would say that they reduce fear of dying. Um, I think it takes work to overcome it completely. I don't know that we completely overcome it. Um, but I think the ways that they, that I've seen psychedelics reduce fear is that it simulates death. It, um, a lot of people who experience, uh, plant medicine retreats or, um, ceremonies explain how they felt or they witnessed the death of their ego. And while that seems frightening to actually experience it is altogether beautiful or can be. Um, so I can only go by my own personal experiences. I had a psilocybin experience when I was in my 20s. Again, didn't really go into it with a fear of death. 
Um, but it reiterated to me how there's nothing to be afraid of, that it's um, this peaceful, um, loving energy around you. Um, and again, we can't control the circumstances sometimes of, of, of how we come to die, but right. we can, we can recognize that once death occurs, there is an overwhelming feeling of love. There is an overwhelming feeling of peace and, uh, serenity. And so then when I was in my, when I turned 50, I celebrated by going to a, an ayahuasca retreat. And so I experienced again, just this connection, you know, we all know maybe on one level that we're all connected and that love is all that matters, that we're surrounded by love, but to actually experience ayahuasca, to experience that feeling, mm -hmm. it's altogether different. And Absolutely. so you just know, you know, on a visceral cellular level that we're all connected we're, we've all got love. We came from love. We'll return to love. And so I think that experience um, was is exactly what a lot of people experience. And that is there's nothing to be afraid of that. We're going to that we're, we're comforted and cared for by this energy that's bigger than us. And yeah. we're and there it's going to carry us through. And the other thing that I want to say is, you know, at that retreat, the second night I didn't need the medicine. I felt like I got what I needed the first night. So I right. was I was kind of like a volunteer. And I watched about 40 to 50 little miracles. All of these people at this ayahuasca retreat, making peace with their childhood abusers, um, making uh, working through the trauma that either came on the battlefield or came from their childhood or came from their family and how the medicine really allowed them to work through it and to come out the other side, go through integration and apply it to stay sober, to live with less fear, to deal with medicine resistant depression, to overcome the PTSD that was plaguing them on a daily basis. I mean, it takes work. You have yeah. to integrate, you have to do other things in addition to this, but it, more people need to know that that's available to them in mm -hmm. a variety of different ways. Yes. And, and yeah, reach out and give me a call and let's talk about it. And we'll, we'll find a way, if you really want to um, reduce your fear about dying, we'll find a way to get that done. Yeah, because it is, it's just a fear we have. And once you see that, and once you uncover that veil, it's just so beautiful. And yeah. So we need, we just need to reconnect and connect back to ourselves and yeah. know that life is very much worth living and it's just a beautiful thing. And yeah. just, you know, people say it just in these chats right now, it's so important to have professionals in the spaces like we have with you and so many others that have joined our group. It's this, this word to get out there is just so important. Yeah, there's, so there's another question. This is how did you become a death doula? And is there an educational path to follow? Uh, every doula is different. Um, there are lots of educational paths to follow. I will say that I loved my program at the University of Vermont. Their uh, end of life doula program is phenomenal. So I recommend that. I think Going with Grace is another excellent, excellent educational program. Um, and then I think it's really important to maybe talk to local hospices, see if they have training programs. Um, if you're interested in different um, different groups of people that you want to serve, like I, I serve the LGBTQ plus community. So I made sure to get certified as a queer informed doula. And I think that's important. Um, so, you know, and I also think joining an alliance, a professional alliance like Inelda or Nita, uh, is vital so that you'll continue to learn the skills going forward that you need. And then also Diaspora Psychedelic Society in Jamaica, they actually were, I have a program with them that educates death doulas who want to work with plant medicine as well. And I think so there's I think that Caldwell is a part of that too, isn't she? Yeah, she sure is. And um, yeah, and Rebecca's asking, do you get certified for that? So each program has their own certification. And yes, you can get certified by different groups. 
Um, the different, like the community parts, yes, you can get certified at a, you know, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion from a local LGBTQ plus community um, group. And like, there, there's just so many people who had no, they have no idea that doulas are a thing. And then once right. you let them know, they get so excited and they say, yeah, we want you to come in and talk to our community. And then you kind of work through it from there and find out what different kind of classes you can even lead, workshops you can lead um, that kind of spread the word and also educate people about end of life from different points of view. And you don't need to be a psychologist and you don't need to be somebody previously involved in healthcare. I think a lot of us come at this from different backgrounds mm -hmm. and they're all helpful because you're going to meet all different kinds of people from different backgrounds. I so I you. encourage everybody to get, you know, call hospice and get trained. They'll give you training for free to become a, an educated volunteer and then look into the different programs that are, you know, kind of available at different prices in different locations. And yes, you all are more than welcome to reach out to me with questions anytime. Absolutely. I still like this. And I, I'm still pondering back that question of why. You know, when you said why, and I guess my question of why we die, what my question I was ask is what or what I always feared, what are people going to do if I'm gone? You know, I mean, that would be my question. I was asking myself, if I die, what is everybody going to do if I'm gone? Is that selfish in itself? You know? so. No, I, do think, I mean, it's normal, right? You're being honest about what you're, there is a fear people have of just not existing. What does yeah. that even look like? And yeah. so, and it's really hard. And so the person who's dying is really worried about their loved ones. Right. And their loved ones are really worried about the person dying. Right. And so they just kind of go back and forth and back and forth. And that's why so many times when loved ones kind of lean over and whisper, you know, we'll, we'll be okay. We'll miss you, but we'll be okay. And you can go. A lot of times that's what the person is waiting for. And then they go. They just want to I don't, think, I don't think I could do the job you do because I'd be in tears all the time. That, that's my, that would be my biggest thing. So, yeah, I mean, amazing. people ask me all the time, like, isn't this so depressing? It's actually life affirming. And you. the best way to be with someone who's dying and not bring that on yourself is to just remember when you're doing this work that this isn't about you. That's not your mom. That's not your son. That's not your little girl. That's not your grandma. This is somebody who is dying and they need your support. So be mindful, be in that room and let everything else go. And that it's, it's a constant practice, right? It takes practice every day to be able to just be mindful and in that room with that person and not think about yourself, not think about your loved ones. And if you can do that, then you get to experience this sacred privilege of supporting somebody at a most difficult time and 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 being called on to do whatever it is they're asking you to do. Hmm. Beautiful. Great conversation. I never thought we could get so deep with this, but it's it's really cool. Really yeah. cool. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad we're able to have this talk. We need yeah. more and more of them all over the place so that people feel comfortable to ask those tender questions and and yeah. and work through those awkward kind of uncomfortable moments with loved ones to get right. to, to to be able to give them this beautiful gift of making your plans and making your decisions so they don't have to yeah because i think we all have this in common because we all pretty much know somebody that dies or we're all going to die so it's something we all have in common so it's something we should really be talking about a lot more. I agree. So you you invite me back anytime. I'm happy yeah. to be here. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, you're much, welcome. Much love to you. Thank you for this conversation today. I really appreciate you. You got it. Be well. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.